Good morning, everybody. Welcome to class uh, and welcome to this week seven. Uh, we are on October 5th today uh, and we'll uh, start a new series of topics. Uh, and, and it feels like it has been a long time ago, but on Friday was when we had kind of a milestone and we sat, uh, talked about semester projects and, 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 and kind of marked the end of the series of topics we covered before. And so today we will start and this is a good fit, uh, we will start a new topic on machine learning. Uh, and I have been busy putting things on Blackboard and things that are related to what we do today and a little bit later, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about them. Uh, and so uh, I know this week is also something that coincides with a few other things, and so I want to acknowledge that, and I will mention what those things are. Uh, but let me, uh, as people join in, uh, as we usually do, we are going to start with a warm-up question today. Uh, and Today's warm-up question is going to be directly related to what we will discuss. And if you remember the first week I had, I don't remember which day it was, uh, had a fun question that asks you what is um, a take born favorite phrase you have uh, that kind of has made it to our vocabulary. Uh, and there were some very interesting, insightful things. But today's topic, uh, question is going to be somewhat related to that because we're going to talk about machine learning. And this phrase, uh, you know it, uh, and your friends know it, maybe your parents know it, or maybe even your grandparents know it, it has become part of our vocabulary. I wonder how much of a good job it does, that phrase itself, telling what this really is. And so my uh, warm up question is going to require a little bit of thinking, and, and this is what the question is. If you were to describe machine learning, with two or three other words, a phrase, what would that phrase be? Come up with a phrase that describes what machine learning is. You could use one of those words, learning or machine, but I prefer that it is completely different from those two. What would your description of machine learning be? One word, two word, up to three words. And so it's a fairly complicated way to say this. And I have always picked somebody to type up uh, the warm up question and I have, uh, an algorithm I run in my head to draw a random name. So today's name will be Taib. Taib, uh, if I'm saying your name, if I'm not pro pronouncing it correctly, I'm sorry, but, but that's the name I picked today. And he's among the ones who have logged in early today. So that is my random pick in my head, the random generator that picks a name. You go ahead and type it and you will type it one more time. So the question is, if you were to find an alternative phrase to describe machine learning, what would that be? You are allowed to use up to three words, but not more. That's the warm-up question for the day. And I will take a look when, when you are done, okay? Uh, so I hope you have all been settled and you are getting to start with what we will be discussing today. And let me go get started. Uh, let me begin by taking a few moments. And this is something that I have said already. We've got quite a number of things to cover and we have, I will try to cover as much as I can. And if we don't finish all the slides what I have for today, that should be okay. But I will go at a faster uh, pace. So, so let me first make some announcements and I will try to be as quick as I can on this one. I have updated the syllabi. The syllabus were there. Uh, we've, as you know, we've got 475 and 575 students taking this class. Uh, and so there is no change in what we are going to cover in the course. We have done some time. We have spent some time uh, having to look at what you said in the initial pre-course survey. And so there is a general idea I had. And so there is no change in mind. But there was a change in order of topics we did. And so we brought up the data visualization topic much earlier than one was originally shown on the syllabus. And I've told you that I would update it. And so I did get the time to do that uh, this weekend on Friday, I think it was, but, but I have updated the syllabi and they are posted. So if you have gotten this 24 hours uh, update you get from Blackboard, there might have been so many things that have happened. One of those was around the syllabi. So the order of topics is updated, data visualization is moved up. Uh, there was some kind of rough schedule I had for assignments, but we did better than what I told we would do in the beginning. And so I changed it, what the assignment schedule was shown to be on the syllabus. And so that's the other update. Uh, the project is now out. Friday is when we discussed. And so there were milestones and there were some dates that are associated, project proposal, 
progress report and final report. Those are indicated now in the syllabus. So you've got a copy. Uh, these are on Blackboard. Uh, we're not going to go there today because we want to save time, but it is updated. For those of you who are taking this one as 575, you have, in addition to assignments, midterm, uh, and project, uh, you also have uh, a survey paper to write. I will talk about that one uh, on Friday, what it is, and we'll not spend a lot of time, but it is indicated in the syllabus what the dates are associated with it. I want to make that one friendlier to you. So that means there is a little bit of separation between what the, uh, the report date is for projects and what the date is for survey paper. The nature of them, I'll talk about them at another time. That's bullet point number one. Syllabi are updated and they are posted on Blackboard. The place to find it is in the place where it says content, uh, course information, and it was there all the time now that you've got new files. In order to update them, I had to delete what was there. And so the new that are added are the ones that are current. This is also reflected in the course's public website. Okay, that was syllabi. The other thing I did in the weekend was uh, up, uploaded uh, a video, uh, almost an hour long video on a Python um, library tool called PyVs. And this is to supplement the discussion we have had on visualization. We have completed it. We've done good amount of lectures and we've got some additional material. We have seen other things, but this one, uh, my if you've noticed the visualization preference I have is because of what it offers is more biased towards R. But Python has also, and I know a good number, well, some of you, uh, at least the 475 students are predominantly Python oriented. And so you will probably do projects in Python and things like that. Uh, and I wanted for you to know of this tool. And I found actually the video very interesting. I have never seen it before. But the, the point of this video is to talk about a visualization tool, a library called PyVs. And so it's a large effort. Anaconda, which distributes Python, uh, invests a lot. There are many people who have very serious interests in the very many companies. And so this or, you know, presentation was out of one of those conferences that Donna has. I was not aware of it. I came across it and I thought this was a good, good resource to add to what we have discussed there. You will find out for those of you who would pick a project that is heavier on visualization, even if your project is not heavy on visualization, you will find it very useful. So take the time to watch it when you get the chance. So think of it as a resource that is being added to the discussion we have been having on visualization, where someone at Anaconda has tried to pull together different kinds of Python libraries all over the place that do different kinds of things. And each one of them is good at what they do. They're very good at what they do. And so these people have put them together. And you would be surprised. The title of that presentation says, you know, 100, well, 1 billion points to visualize on a, on, on a, in a dynamic fashion with 30 lines of code of Python. That's what it is. And in fact, the that's attractive itself. The slide that shows you what the talk is about says everything. And, and including there are 30 lines of code that are in Python that would do fairly massive thing, I would, I would say. I mean, if they were, if, if somebody was not to put together something like that, it would have taken a, a lot of effort and probably not as good as what that one shows. So I would very strongly encourage you to watch that video and use it, especially if you are oriented towards Python for what you want to do. Point number two, that was point number two, bullet point number two. Uh, by the way, I didn't say this, uh, but these slides are up on Blackboard, but I would rather have you follow me along here and, and you can, uh, if you want to take notes, you can do that, but, but they are there. Uh, the third one, the third bullet point is about material. I have been updating and posting on Blackboard before I posted the slides half an hour ago. And this happened yesterday. And I did put material that is related to the discussion we will have today. Today's discussion is based on, this is the best place I have, the best really place I have for talking about a primer, a premiere. Is that the word? Premier, I think, to get an overview on machine learning. And this is a chapter from a book that we're not going to be using for the rest of the semester, but just that chapter is a useful discussion. And so I have posted a chapter from that book, which is freely available. The author makes it available. And so I posted it on Blackboard. And this is under today's lecture uh, or lectures and today's date. That chapter, like many other things I have done before on, on or a couple other things I have done on Blackboard before, may have, you may struggle to open it. Uh, because it's a fairly large file. So for that reason, I wanted to have a link to the book's website 
uh, which is what the third point is talking about. And that would actually give you access to more things the author has made. This book, when it was originally written, was written where the codes that are associated in the book are written in MATLAB. This was in 2012 when the book came out. It is one of the popular books and it has won some prizes and things like that on machine learning. Uh, but then um, the, there's a second edition coming up now. It's going to be coming out in fall 2021, says the author in his website, uh, and that's going to be in Python. And so I have additional reason for having to, to, to point that link to the web, to the book's website, other than to tell you that if you struggle getting chapter one from that book, you can go there and get it. That's one reason. But the other more important reason is you actually have a link to some of the resources that the author has made on a GitHub uh, repo about Python code that accompany the book. Uh, this is a good book to, to, to have a reference on and machine learning in general. That was bullet number three. Bullet number four brings me to what's happening on campus today or, or this week. And this is for those of you who are taking this class as 475 is the career fair week. And so there are ha things happening and there may be interviews and so on. And so I, I, I got a question today uh, for somebody who probably would want an extension for assignment four. Assignment four was due on Wednesday. Those of you who are ready, who are almost ready, please go ahead and do that. But for those of you who would need time and we would also to participate in the career fair that happens, uh, I have extended this by two days. We don't have a whole lot of room for extensions and we, I would like to keep us on schedule, which we are doing in a good way so far. And therefore I can't extend this any further than this. And it's probably going to mean a lot for you to get those two days of extension. So assignment force deadline is extended from Wednesday midnight to Friday midnight. Friday is October 9. We need the weekend for grading and everything else or whatever it is that we want to do. Uh, and so that's the time you have, but you've got a 48 hours extension for assignment four. And I know some of you have started submitting. That was bullet point four, project, project ideas. The document I went through on, I, I talk about project setup and then I talked about project ideas document and I told you it is dynamic and it is indeed dynamic. And so there are a few, a couple ideas I am adding. And so they will come out and I would expect an updated version. I don't want to keep posting things that change every now, every time. So let me have, take the time that I want to refine one more idea or add one more idea. We could use as many ideas as we can because we have a fairly large class. And so expect an update on Wednesday and then I will post. Uh, but there will be some very nice, very intriguing and fun projects and, and interesting projects that are going to be added. Uh, I have reasonable expectations. I talked about this once on Friday. You have an assignment, you have things to are for following, you are following the lecture. So I don't expect you to have gone through that 12 pages document the way it was and pick up a topic. It's okay if it will take time. And in fact, it is better if you take time, just be familiar with them, get an idea for what they are, but it, it's okay for, for you not to have to commit to an idea. Uh, but the teammate issue is a point and Unfortunately, we don't have too many ways in which you can interact with each other and know who your teammate is. So I have, I'm not sure if it's a great idea, but I have set up a Google spreadsheet that I have posted uh, uh, and made it available for everybody to trade. If you wanted my help to get a teammate and you wanted to tell me that you express that interest and also roughly tell me which idea you are leaning towards, that spreadsheet is for you to use. If you don't have any idea for which ones you are leaning towards, or even not sure if you are actually looking for a teammate, you can take your time. But let me use this as one way. You can also email me, which you have, some of you have done, okay? So, so I just wanted to point that one out. If uh, like Cody has done, you've got some other way to interact with each other and find out who you want to work with, that's fine. I just need finally, when the time comes to submit your project proposal, I need to know your teammate. And what I'm trying to do with this one is help you find a teammate if you're looking for one, that's the point, okay? So if the spreadsheet is useful, use it. If you have problem accessing it, the first time I had it on, it was probably not even editable, now it is. Uh, use it and you will see how people are leaning and where they are headed and things like that. But you don't have to use it if you don't need it. All right, uh, we finished. The last point is what I did on Friday. This was the week where we ended week six and most of the most, majority of you have completed that one, but there are some who have not. This is for me to get an idea for how things are going. I really want to know how things are going. And so please, if you have not completed that one, complete today. So what I'm going to do now is ask someone else. I'll ask uh, 
Brett, Brett and Zalabu, okay? Uh, to type in the chat uh, the Qualtrics survey uh, link. Uh, I don't know where you would find it. You'd find it in the email. You'd find it on Blackboard also. Grab that one and put it here. And those of you who have not completed when you get a chance, it should take you not less than a minute or, minute or two, maybe. And so let me ask you to, to Brett, to, to type in in the chat session that link for the Qualtrics survey. You don't have to do it if you've done. So those of you who have not, please go ahead and complete it. That's what I want you to do. All right, uh, I'm going to get to the subject we want to discuss today. Anybody has got any questions for me before I do that? Uh, yeah, just one question. Uh, sure. So when we uh, up the, so when we uh, submit a proposal, will it be a group uh, group submission or an individual submission? Yes. So that's a good question, actually. So we will create uh, just like the assignments, a way for you to submit things on Blackboard. Uh, and uh, if you know your teammate, you can mention that, and one submission is enough. What I don't know now at this point is to allow people to submit in group, which means uh, there will be less than the number of students' submissions. Now you will have. If you have a teammate, you submit one, your teammate doesn't need to submit another one. But because I don't know who the teammate is yet, I can't create a submission that would know, that would help me know, you know, here's team one, here's team two, here's team three. We haven't come there yet. So one submission per team is enough and it doesn't matter which person is submitting it. Uh, the grading, it's not grading really, but the, the thing that you would get feedback from me is whether it's approved or not, and then I would make sure that you, you, you get to know that, including potentially a change of a teammate, some, some, some reshuffling or something like that. So one submission is enough per teammate and it doesn't matter who is submitting it. When we have actually found out which teams are, and I want to quick do this as early as possible, then the submission will be team-based and then exactly the, the team members will be listed in the assignment that will be created. I guess that would answer your question. Yeah, uh, you. While I'm on this, well, while I'm this slide, let me also tell 475 students one thing that's coming up. October 14 is a deadline for me as a professor to give your midterm grades. You, our midterm for this class is late and we have only one exam and it is late as I have told you. So it's not going to happen before October 14. What I usually do for this course is take the average of the assignments we have been graded up to that point and that will be reported as your midterm grade. That will give you some idea for how you're doing at least in terms of assignment, but that's what will happen. Therefore, uh, if we complete grading all four assignments, it will be an average of those four. If not, then it will be the average of three. And therefore the dates are important for us for that reason also. And so keep that in mind. I know that some of you also would have midterms for that reason this week. And, and I appreciate that. And I understand that we don't have a midterm, but we have uh, busy and I don't want you to be lagging behind on the topics we are covering. Any other questions? Okay, then I'm going to get started with what we want to do. Okay, uh, this is a, a reminder for us. And now that we have been talking about a little bit of practical things or, or things related to material that are available, it's a good reminder for us to know where we are. Uh, in terms of this course, we have spent some time talking about the data science process. We have covered all of these boxes, except for the one that we are going to go in now. There is a box called build data product some of you will have a project that would actually do it. Otherwise, we have spent time talking about things that are related to processing data, cleaning data, visualization, and exploratory data analysis on some of them more than a week or, or like, for example, on visualization. So we're going to go into one of these boxes, which fits into this process, and which is going to be on machine learning. And I have asked you to tell me what your two or three words description of what machine learning would be. And I'm very, very curious to see what you have said there. So machine learning is a topic we have for an overview today. Uh, one way to describe what machine learning is, and as I have told you, this is based on the chapter from Murphy's book, and you will see some of the things that are going to be the, including notations in what I will be talking about now are uh, reflections of that, but I, it's because they represent things that I agree with and they are a good way to say them. So one way to say what machine learning is to call it a set of methods for automatically detecting patterns in data. And that would be a good useful definition for machine learning. Automatically detecting patterns in data. The word data is there and our task, and that's where the machine is coming, is to automatically detect 
patterns in data. And then use these uncovered patterns, the ones that we discovered, to the ones that we have to detect it, to do one of two things. One, to predict future data, uh, and you will see what that would mean in a second, or to perform other kind of decision making under uncertainty. The word uncertainty shows up here, and it is so crucial, so crucial to generally machine learning, but so crucial to the approach this author of this book does. In fact, if you have noticed uh, the, the title of that book, you would see where uncertainty would come into the picture. So in machine learning, there are several sources for uncertainty. One uh, of them is to say, what's the best prediction about the future given some past data, which is the central question we have when you do predictions. Uh, what is your best prediction? And therefore, there is uncertainty. There is a notion of probability. Uh, the other is, what is the best model to explain some data? Because you've got choices. We've got, in fact, if for those of you taking a machine learning class that goes very deeply into them, you would have. But even in this class, you would learn that there are different models that you could use. And so what is the best model to, ex to, to explain some data? Uh, what you would, you'd be surprised to kind of think about the third point that this one is making. What measurement should I perform next? Uh, one of the premises, like everybody has these days, is we've got plenty of data. We've got lots of data, and we're trying to get things out of them, get inside, and automatically detect patterns. But you would be surprised sometimes we actually have a reason to perform measurements, to, do, to design experiments, to generate even more data. And that becomes a machine learning question itself. And there are some good things that you would learn both from this course and in other from your own uh, things that you would do around your project, where that becomes a major issue. So a probabilistic approach is taken to deal with this because there is uncertainty. And all of us know by now uh, have had some background one way or another to appreciate why uh, we need a tool for this, and that's called probability. So the book emphasizes us very heavily. It's not all approaches, all people, all way of thinking, all framework that this approach is emphasized very heavily, but this book does do that, and for a reason, and that would allow uh, kind of to have a, a, a view in which you are not necessarily ad hoc, you're not necessarily saying this method works, and, and why, because we've tried it, and it has, you know, here are the different places where this one has worked. You, 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 you would be able to reason around it in a much rigorous fashion if you have a unifying way to look at them. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult, I should say, but this is the approach the book does. And, and so these uncertainties are covered or, or addressed by taking a probabilistic approach. The moment I say probabilistic approach, and I know I have in the class, people with a stronger background in statistics, you would, you would, that should invoke something in your mind to say there is a similar thing that is done in statistics. In fact, another way to think about the overview discussion we would have now today would have been called to say statistical learning uh, and machine learning and statistical learning in some communities are used interchangeably, but there is a slight difference in emphasis and terminology. And that is what I'm trying to point out here. In the machine learning community, or, or generally in machine learning, the emphasis is on large scale applications and prediction accuracy. If you have run into places, you probably have published yourself in something that has to do with machine learning, uh, and you see some people how they talk about what they have done, the most important thing for many is the prediction accuracy. I'm telling you this, and here is my model, and here is how accurate it is. And that is kind of where the emphasis is. And usually it is about large scale applications. In statistical learning, the emphasis is more on models and their interpretability and their precision and the uncertainty and the confidence that you can say about it and the things that you can say, sh sh talk about those, those models. Uh, there are other ways to reinterpret this and say where, where prediction and inference are the key words that distinguish one over another, but at least for this one and this one, this, this distinction is enough. And I want you to both be able to say this in this way and I appreciate what I'm trying to say with this, with this uh, kind of distinctions. Uh, the book or the chapter that I have, uh, you know, uh, say it is a further reading for this one, makes a reference to somebody who has made some fun kind of terminology, you know, glossary or some kind of uh, ways in which things that are called in the machine learning community are called in statistical 
learning community and, and, and that is done by somebody who does who has written and major, made major contributions to statistical learning we'll come back to that person later on in the course but this is a good distinction to keep in mind all right types of machine learning uh, I have put the syllabus you have seen uh, and, and you have probably heard them very many times. Here are the two classes or the two types of machine learning problems. One class is called predictive analytics or predictive analysis or predictive modeling. A, an equivalent term for it, a synonym for it would be called supervised learning. And this is when you learn a mapping from input X to output Y. So there is some mapping, there is some function that's taking inputs to outputs. And the goal is to learn it, to find out that function. Uh, when you are given information, labels as they are called, on the set of input output pairs. So you're given pairs, the input output relationship is given. And so you are going to learn a mapping so that uh, in a, outside of the ones that you're given as training, and we'll spend a, uh, a slide in the next one to talk about this one, uh, you would use that training to find out what that function is so that you can make predictions on inputs that you have not seen before, the ones that you have not learned on. That is supervised learning. The supervision is that you've been given this, this thing and this thing are related in this way. Supervised. The other class, big class, is unsupervised or it's also called descriptive. It's not predictive, it's descriptive. And here it is loose. Uh, you are now given data. That's all you have. Go find interesting patterns in it. And I put interesting patterns in quotation marks because it's not that easy to know what they are. But there is a big class and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about them too. These are the two major ones. For now, the, the thing that is supervised and unsupervised, predictive and un, un, uh, descriptive is enough of a, a distinction to make. There is a third one uh, that has come a major appearance these days, uh, maybe the last three, four days, uh, years, maybe the, even more the last couple of years, and that's called reinforcement learning. Uh, I have asked you what your view is on machine learning alternative ones to say, but, but the word learning is there. And that's not a coincidence that the word learning is there. It has to do a lot with how we learn, just like we now learn in the old days, learn something, right? And so when we are uh, in the realm of supervised learning, we are provided examples. Here is one thing, here is another thing, here is a third thing, here is a fourth thing, and this one is called this. You know, all of these things like that look like this are called houses. Some of them are, you know, nice looking castles, and others have some other older architectures. But whenever you see something like this, it has got a window, it has got a door, it's a house. You may teach your kid like that, right? Uh, or, or, or your sibling younger than you. That's supervised learning. And then there is another one that is not supervised and will we'll, we'll say what it is. And so you, you, you're left, you're not given examples. But there's another way we teach people. We, we, that kid, that example I told you earlier, you tell them you know, to behave in a certain way. And when they do that, you reward them. You give them an ice cream. And, uh, you know, you, you, your, your effort is rewarded. And, and so they would learn that this thing, okay, so, so if I do this thing, I get a reward. And, and if I don't, I get uh, you know, penalized for it. And so there is a score. There is something that they want to achieve. And that type of learning is called reinforcement learning. It has become a big field. We're not going to, unfortunately, in this class, not going to spend a lot of, no, we're not going to spend any time discussing it, but it is a big field on its own now. So what we will cover instead will be supervised learning and unsupervised learning, but no reinforcement learning. Uh, let's go to supervised learning now and, and unpack a little bit about what that one is. Uh, when I discuss this, uh, it is very likely that some of you are very familiar with this. It's very likely that there are a good portion of you who are new, who are new to this one. So both ways, just follow along with me, and maybe there is some precision you would get in your own understanding, and especially um, uh, the, the, the terminology that I would be using now and the notations that I would be using now. That's probably important to know. So we are in the realm of predictive learning. And what we will be doing when we do predictive learning, supervised learning, is learn a mapping from inputs to outputs when we are given a pair. And that pair, for the purpose I have for this lecture, uh, we will call it a D. And that's the, the notation we will use. The set D is called the training set. People use it all the time. So this is my training set. And we'll call that one a D. So in the simplest setting, uh, the training input 
is a d-dimensional vector. Don't worry too much about what the, the thing is. It's a vector is probably the most important thing. The most common thing is for the training set to be a vector and it's got d dimensions. And this could be, uh, you know, numbers, for example, the height and weight of a person. These things are called, to just go back to the slide I had a couple of slides ago, where we had statistical learning and machine learning communities. Actually, the names of these things would also reflect which community you're coming from. In the machine learning community, these are called features. And this is a big topic, by the way. Sometimes you have them, they're there. Sometimes you'll have to, to extract them so that they become meaningful. We'll see one example today already. And so these are called features. The things that are in your input, in your training, it is a d-dimensional vector and, and each one of them could be a, a number. For example, these are called features. They're also called attributes. That will be a name that you would probably mostly hear in the statistical learning community. If you remember Stephanie's guest lecture, she was saying covariate so many times. I'm not sure how many of you picked up on that word. That's an alternative name. And there is a reason why it is called covariate. There are three different names for exactly the same thing. Features is probably, I would bet, 90% of this class would know things like that. Here are the features, here are the features, here are the features. Uh, so those are your input. In general, uh, these features could be complex structured objects. They just don't have to be just numbers. They could be an image, they could be an email. They could be a, an entire time series. They could be a shape. They could be a graph, a graph here, I mean, a network. So it could be arbitrarily complex object. The output is also called a response variable. That would be the name that statistician would like to call it. Is It would also could be anything, but the most common thing is for each y, i to be either a categorical or nominal. These are synonyms for some finite set. You know, it got different things to label things from uh, cat, dog, uh, some other animals, right? So, so categories, right? Labels, and they don't have anything in between. So this is this is um, one type of data uh, variables we have seen in the beginning of the the week, you know this course. And so that could be one possibility. The other is each VI is actually a real valued scalar. It's not a categorical value, but it is a number. 28.7 or 98.6 or, or some 1,258. Those are real valued scalar values. So one way to think about this one is what is my output? Is it a categorical value or is it a real valued value? That itself now brings me to say the two major ways in which we can think about supervised learning. Whenever that YI is categorical, the problem is called classification because you are now trying to say this is which class it belongs to. The word class there is category. Uh, or this is also called pattern recognition. So I am sure some of you, when I say matter what machine learning is, I have a gut feeling, I haven't looked at what you say, but someone might have said pattern recognition, which is not a bad thing to guess. Um, or, or you might have said something else. Uh, so when it is a classification, when one, the YIs are categorical values, the problem is called classification. When the YIs are real valued, the problem is called regression. Uh, that was supervised learning. Unsupervised learning, uh, we are not given examples, a pair between XI and YI, and we are going to learn a mapping, a function, which we are going to say here is the one that was model what we have seen was what we did in supervised learning. In unsupervised learning, we don't come with a function like that that map, that takes inputs to outputs. Instead, we discover knowledge. We discover patterns in the data. This problem, when you think of it, is ill-defined because now it's up to me to say what it is that I'm going to, to find it. That doesn't make it easier. In fact, it makes it harder and there is no metric to measure what one one is. We will see uh, things that are associated with this that would help us come up with models that would help us define metrics in, in, in return to talk about unsupervised learning, but it is an, uh, not a well-defined problem. So let me give you some examples on uh, supervised learning and we'll begin with classification. If you look at the topics we have as we go through the syllabus, we bring regression first. Uh, we have seen two kinds of supervised learning problems, regression and classification. Regression is when your yi is scalar value, a real valued, a number, and classification is when your output is going to be one of many uh, types or classes, right? 
And so if you see the machine learning in general, I have told you this before, the vast majority of problems are of classification type. And so there is less, but we want to discuss regression first because some of the methods we need there are a good starting points. But here I would start with classification first. Uh, so let me give you a toy example. You might have seen this, an example like this on, on other occasions. This is probably one popular example that somebody has drawn as a cartoon and is used, including in this book uh, chapter that, that you have. And so think about these objects that you see now that have got different shapes and different colors, and they have been labeled. And so they have been given classes, and the classes we have for them now are called one and zero, yes and no. And so you see uh, these objects that are given, and the uh, figure that you see on the left. And what you see on the right is your training example. And this is called a design metrics. So the metrics has got the features, which we have said are, you know, attributes uh, on the columns. And it has got these examples, the examples that you see on, on this uh, drawing. And not all of them are shown, but some of them are shown. This comes close to what a data frame is. You've got this observation or cases on the rows, and you've got the values or attributes on the columns, that's what this design matrix is. And so this one has got a size N by D, N is how many cases you have, and D is how many features you have. And you can see that it's color and the shape and there is a size. And what you see on the right is the label, that's a vector. Now you've got something that would correspond to each of these cases. And so the examples we have, have got a one and a zero. And the question now we have is on something we have not seen. So the thing that are in the inner boxes, are the ones that are our training example, the training set. And we know what they are labeled as. We know some of them are called yes and some of them are called no. And what we are going to do is when something new comes, like a crescent, a blue crescent, or a, a donut shape with the, with the yellow color gives one on a, on a blue arrow, what are we going to classify it? Are we going to classify it as a yes or are we going to classify it as a no? This is done by having to come uh, first assume that there is actually a mapping that takes these x's, the objects that you see here, and gives them these labels, one or zero, and that's my y. So y equals to f of x is a function that we assume exists, and now we're going to find an approximation for it. And I'm going to use this mark like a prime, it looks like a prime, but I don't have a good way in PowerPoint to show a hat, but actually in the book it shows, or in this chapter that I posted, it has a hat. And so Y has a hat and F also has a hat on it. To just say that you are trying now to come up with a function that would approximate what we assume to exist so that we would use this uh, approximation in proxy of the one that we think lies under it, and it will do some job on classifying the objects that we are now yet to see. Okay, so when we're given something like this, uh, like, like for example, the blue crescent, it's kind of easy for us to know where to put it in the yes or no category. Because we see that every yellow thing or, or blue thing has been categorized as yes. When we see this uh, crescent, we would likely call it uh, yes, right? That's what we would give it. But think about the one that's the, this donut the yellow one. This one is difficult because there are some yellow things that are grouped as yes, and there are some yellow things that are grouped as no. There are some uh, circle looking things that are grouped as yes, and there are some circle looking things that are grouped as no. So whichever feature we use here kind of makes it difficult. And that is where probability would come in. So what we do instead is that when cases like this are ambiguous, we need to come up with a probabilistic prediction. And so what we will do is to find out, this is the place where this probabilistic argument, the probabilistic approach this book advocates comes in. And if you have seen uh, machine learning literature, you would have noticed what I am going to be explaining now. And this is said in terms of probability distributions. Okay, so the probability distribution that we would associate with supervised learning when the problem is a classification type has got this four. P is my probability distribution. And I've got two things under that parenthesis. The first one is a conditional probability. What y given x, remember what x is, these are the examples that we are given, and so we would say y given x, and we've got the t, which is our design matrix, the one that our training set, in other words. So y given x is a conditional probability, and d is our design matrix, and that probability is what we have. What we will do then is to say, if I put this the question I have, the donut, uh, and I'm going to say in yes, I will have my C equal to one, 
that's y equal to one, and what will be, according to this example, what probability would I get for it? And I would do um, a zero, and I would get a probability. And I would then give my answer that would increase my guess. And that will be my best guess. So, so the highest probability, then when I, the answer I would give is this yellow uh, donut is yes with this probability, no with this probability. And the one that's higher, I would give it. But that is what this best guess situation means. This is also called, it's, this is the mode of the distribution when you have the conditional distribution, the probability distribution in this fashion for the design matrix D. This is also called maximum a, prop, a priori is I think what the MAP stands for. You get an estimate like that, you get a number, and that's what you would predict. This is how classification works when you view it as a probability prediction. And that you, you would, what you would get is best guess. Now, if this was a probability distribution, you may say something for sure when that probability is a one. So like, for example, the crescent uh, blue here, would give me a probability of one and there is nothing else. In fact, that's exactly what I would get. And you can view it from your uh, visual here that there is no other thing that I would guess about this one. So, so that would be my answer with the probability of one. But that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes you actually be very far off from one and the best answer you can give and some sophisticated machine learning algorithms would do that when it is very far away from one the better thing to do would be instead of classifying it with such a low value to say i don't know this is a good moral value for us to learn too so, so if we you know our confidence is so low we, but we better say i don't know and that's actually uh true for some of the fields there are some places where uh, after your choice of a classification algorithm has given you some value where you would be reluctant to declaring it in that label. And there will be some fields where for, for which it is okay. So if you are in medicine, for example, you would be very, very curious, careful about associating some diagnosis, you know, with the probability that's low. But if you are in trying to get, you know, attractions on a, on a website and you are going to predict this is user is, you know, your desired group, like, you know, a certain age group and a certain preference, you're okay. If you, know, if you make a mistake, it's not going to be that disastrous. You will be okay. But if it is something that requires higher accuracy, you would have. So, so this probability associated value will also determine what action you will take. Uh, if I had time a lot, I would have told you about Watson's story. Watson is that IBM machine that was made uh, and then that bit Jeopardy. Uh, one of the places you would probably have uh, some other occasion to learn more about it. One of the things that it did was uh, was good at was to know when not to buzz. People are usually you know buzzing for an answer for a question if they think they know the answer. But Watson was calculating calculating those probabilities so judiciously, and so it would buzz only if its probability is high enough, and therefore it would avoid having to lose points. Um, and 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 there is some uh, some things about smart ad selection system. Google does this uh, this base with click-through rates where probably much of the same idea is used. Okay, let me give you some real-world examples of classification. Uh, we will do in one of the assignments, I hope, uh, uh, the fifth one, uh, or if not, we will find a way to get it, uh, where you will actually do document classification. So if you've got a document, you are going to classify it into one of C classes. So for example, if I give you a document, then you're going to tell me which class of a news paper colon this belongs to? Is it sports? Is it news? Is it business? Is it obituary? What, 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 would, what would you do to classify documents of that kind? That's a major problem. A smaller pro or, or a variant of that problem is to detect whether a spam or an email is spam or not. That is document classification. And this would give you a good idea for how many different things that actually could come when you have a problem of classification of that kind. The spam detection problem is easy because it's got a binary one. So it's, is it spam or ham, as they call it? Uh, is it legit or not? Uh, image classification is a huge area. Uh, you can imagine starting from x-ray detection to everything that you see, computer vision and things like that, where you have to classify images. You can take it one step further and then say not only classify images, uh, here is a house, here is a traffic light, here is a tree, but also detect like for example, face recognition and all artificial intelligence these days would belong there. So, so these are examples uh, that I don't have a whole lot of time to kind of elaborate on now, but let me 
take you through an example that probably would be very quick and quick to describe now. Uh, and this will be about somebody who is a botanist, but also a statistician called Fisher, who has, who has uh, kind of gave this you know, uh, demonstration and it's used frequently in many machine learning books. We are going to classify flowers. And these are the three flowers that you see. And so the goal here is to say whether uh, this flower is setosa or versicolor or virginica. And if you were to go by their images and look at this one and try to detect and to, to, to do this classification, it will be a very, very difficult problem. In fact, there is a much easier way to do this. And that botanist and, and some of the analysis he has done that is given to his name's credit would find out how to use good features from these uh, flowers to, detect, or to classify them. And, and what he did was there were uh, four useful features, sepal lengths, sepal widths, petal lengths and petal widths that would help us determine, classify this, these flowers. So if you do an EDA, the book, by the way, you are now very educated people, so you know the value of EDA. We've spent a lot of time talking about them. Uh, he has extracted these four features, the botanist that is. And so this is a lesson also for us to know when to use good features to help us come up with good machine learning algorithms. So there is no machine learning algorithm right now here. This is just EDA. In fact, it is a scatter plot that shows you how relationships are between sepal petal lengths and petal widths. And there are four of them. And so how they relate, correlate with one another. So what you see on the diagonal is something against itself. And this is just the distribution of it. But the other ones are a scatter plot. And already, when you look at this one, you could find out that sep I think it is sepal length is a good separator for the things that are red. And the red are the ones that are called setosa. The other ones, the blue and green, are the other two flowers. And they're kind of mixed together. But the red one is clearly separated from, from these other ones. And so you could use this to, to classify them. And this is feature extraction uh, example that I want to highlight. Uh, my goal is to, I, I, I knew that we will not be finishing this one. So unsupervised learning will be something that we will come back to on Wednesday and we'll borrow a peek. The, the, like, the slides are there. So if you want to read ahead, you will. But I want to spend some time talking about them. But let me finish um, the discussion on supervised learning. So what we have gone through now so far was on classification. Let me spend a minute or two talking about regression. This is the time where we want to find, given data points like the blue curves here, we are going to find a function that would approximate it, that would help us now say something about a new value when it comes. And, and this is what regression is. So, so find a function that approximates it. What you see on the left is a fit to this data when the model is linear. And you can see that it's not doing such a great job. Sometimes the points are way off from this line. Uh, the thing on the right is when we have a higher order polynomial, uh, and this is degree two, and it does a better job. The point here is you've got points, plots uh, that are showing relationships between input and output, and you are determining a function that would be a good fit to this so that you can, when a new thing comes, you would find it. That's what regression means. There are many problems in the real world where regression is the right model. Uh, if we had time, I would have asked you in class to tell me some examples, but let me go through. Predict tomorrow's stock market given how the things are uncertain now, uh, given the current market conditions and other possible side information, what would it be? The value, it will be this number, that number. That, this is a regression problem. Predict the age of a viewer watching a given video on YouTube. Uh, you've seen some things that would help you uh, get some points like the blue ones you showed before, and so you want to predict. The location of a, a robot arm uh, and an AMD factor given some signals, torques, and a set of other motor parameters. Uh, predict the amount of you know, specific antigen, uh, prostate-specific antigen uh, in the body as a function of the number of different clinical measurements. You can get a sense for where I am headed. These are examples picked up from that chapter, but they all touch on different fields or different areas. Predict the temperature at the location inside a building, uh, where you have weather data, time, uh, some sensors around the doors and things like that, okay? This is the place where I wanted to stop. And next time we would uh, pick up on, and you've got the slides already on unsupervised learning. And that will be, give us a good introduction to some of the topics that would come under unsupervised learning, which is what we would cover uh, 
after we are done with supervised, a, a series of topics on supervised learning. And we would be looking at algorithms in each one of those. The point now is to have a premiere of discussion around this. Okay, uh, we are almost time up. Uh, I can take a question if you have a quick one. Anybody has got any quick question? There's a All question right. in the chat. There's a question in the chat. All right, uh, let, me, let me take this one on Wednesday. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about more general ways. Uh, and then the unsupervised learning and what we do about dimensionality reduction has got some indirect relationships to it. Uh, I'm going to look at also what you have said on machine learning. Okay, on the interest of keeping people who have got to go somewhere else, uh, I didn't save enough time for discussion, but let me pick up uh, on Wednesday and we'll talk about unsupervised learning uh, at that point. All right, I'll stop here.